And my second go at um, this presentation, we did a prenatal presentation that went really well. Um, and we're excited to kind of go the opposite end of the spectrum, which is the postpartum recovery piece of it, and um, are really, really looking forward to sharing this information um, and getting the word out because oftentimes postpartum recovery can feel very daunting, whether you are, you know, weeks postpartum, months postpartum, or several years postpartum. Um, you know, it, it definitely is a topic that um, can be discussed no matter how old your kids are or how far out of um, delivery you are. So um, hopefully as we go through today's presentation, everybody will have a, a really nice perspective on how uh, we as women can address how delivering a baby or carrying a baby, uh, the effects that it has on our body. So um, in today's presentation, we're going to start by highlighting, you know, what happens during pregnancy and delivery and what are the effects of that on my body. So certainly, you know, we'll, we'll highlight all of those different areas, but I think at the end of the, the day, we're all pretty confident that there's a lot of stuff going on as we go through that pregnancy and delivery um, procedure. Um, we'll talk about some common pain conditions that happen postpartum. Um, and again, those can be immediately postpartum or can last many, many years after um, delivery. So we'll talk about what those pain conditions are and how we can address those. Uh, we'll talk about some tips for pelvic floor recovery. So certainly, um, you know, the pelvic floor is going to be one of the major things that we're going to want to remediate after carrying a baby. And um, we'll talk about some tips for how to do that. And then I'll hand off to Nicole. She'll go through some exercise myths associated with postpartum recovery, as well as share some sample exercises. Um, I do want to say, um, if you are interested in um, some, you know, top pelvic floor exercises, stay tuned to the end because I'll share a link um, for how to do that. But if you're thinking about hopping off early, the website for that is uh, reachyours.com backslash pelvic. Um, and those are my top five um, pelvic floor recovery exercises. So certainly, you know, if you're not able to make it all the way through to the end of the presentation, please take advantage of going there for that free download um, so that you have some ideas on um, pelvic floor recovery. And keep in mind that um, both Nicole and I are offering free consultations, um, whether that is for, you know, pain remediation or um, pelvic floor tips or exercise recovery. Uh, both she and I are uh, available for free consultation at any time, and we will be sharing our contact information in a follow-up email. So keep an eye out for that after the presentation. Okay, a little bit about us. Um, so I'll, I'll chat first. So my name is Kristen Wilson. Um, I'm a physical therapist of 17 years and co-owner of Action Potential. We're a physical therapy company with two locations, one in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania, and one in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Um, we have recently, and I shouldn't say recently because it isn't that recent anymore. Um, in the past five years, we've developed our pelvic health program, which includes prenatal and postpartum care. Um, we've really enjoyed kind of diving into that role as physical therapists because what we are finding, um, and I'm sure Nicole will echo this as well, is that there's just so many women out there that don't realize the care that's available for them so that they can be successful um, both before and after having children. Certainly as a physical therapist, I see the ramifications of what happens if we don't take care of our bodies further down the road um, as women. Um, so I see that in the form of incontinence, um, pelvic pain, prolapse, um, and really I wanna get the word out early to all of the women out there that this is a problem that can be addressed. Um, I am a mom of three boys. Uh, they are currently 11, nine, and seven. So this is a world that I know very well. Um, and I'm also a very active person. And so as I go through these presentations, I like to share some of my tips to help with that activity level, because no matter what our fitness level is, being active um, is a great way to keep your body in shape. And so with that, I'll pass it off to Nicole, who knows a lot about staying in shape. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nicole Darty. I'm a personal trainer and uh, my own owner of uh, Trainer Mommy LLC, my own business. I started um, officially this past year um, and a mom of three. So my oldest is four and a half, middle is two years old, and then my youngest baby is four months old. So I am also in this newly postpartum phase along with some of you who might be. 
Um, so I've, I've been a personal trainer for 10 years, over 10 years at this point. And, um, I learned through having my first child, um, basically what I didn't know. I thought I knew everything about fitness and I thought it would be, you know, a piece of cake, getting back in shape, getting back to doing what I was doing after having a baby. And it was a lot more challenging than I ever knew. So that's what prompted me to get educated and certified to work with pregnant and postpartum women. And I just fell in love with all of it. And so then I started my own business and now that's currently what I do. A lot of what I do right now is remote. Um, whether it's uh, a small group, um, classes, I do remote programming. I do consultations, um, kind of whatever people need, I help them with. And, um, yeah. And then all day long, I'm home with my kids. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I've done a little bit of everything as far as fitness is concerned. I've done, I've dabbled in bodybuilding, um, CrossFit kind of, you name it. So I like to say that I have experience in a lot of things, which really helps me as a trainer with, um, understanding the client and where you're coming from. And, um, as far as postpartum, just what you want to get back to and how to, um, go from, you know, just had a baby, like what's going on with my body to, I want to get back to doing fill in the blank exercise, or maybe I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to not be in pain anymore and, you know, be active and strong and functional. So that's kind of my, one of my favorite things to do is help moms, um, get and stay strong after having babies. And, you know, so you can be strong moms. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. And really, you know, one of the things that Nicole and I really aligned on when we met is this idea of sharing information, because really when we talk about strength, you know, we want to make sure you have strong bodies, but also strong minds and understanding what's happening within the body. And the best way to do that is to have great education background to understand exactly what the changes are and how you can prevent um, and, and remediate those changes. So let's talk a little bit about what happens after or during pregnancy and after delivery. So certainly um, when we think about pregnancy, we know that changes in hormones are responsible for a lot of flexibility occurring within the body. And this is what allows the pelvic girdle to widen so that the baby can pass through the vaginal canal. Um, it also is what allows the, um, the muscles of the abdomen to stretch in such a way because there are some strong ligaments and strong tendinous attachments of those muscles. So that flexibility allows for the growth of the baby and allows for delivery, but certainly can also lead to an increased risk of pain. Anytime we have a lot of flexibility in the body, um, that means that the body is, we'll say, unstable. And that instability can cause your body to tweak and twinge in different ways leading towards pain. Certainly, um, if we have pain, we want to make sure we address that early on because the body's way of compensating with pain is coming up with a lot of bad habits to avoid the pain. The thing that I found most fascinating about the altered hormonal level and that flexibility is that it can last for up to one year post stopping breastfeeding. So if you uh, deliver and decide not to breastfeed, those changes, those hormonal, hormonal changes will take about a year after delivery. If you decide to be a breastfeeding mom and you breastfeed for six months after delivery, um, you're, not until you stop and fully wean off of breastfeeding will those ligamentous changes start to happen because the body is in such a change of a state of flux from the breastfeeding. So think about, you know, after you're done breastfeeding, it's about a year and afterwards that your body starts to go back to normal from a ligamentous perspective and a hormonal perspective. Um, certainly from a muscle uh, area, we're going to see significant changes in the abdomen as well as the pelvic floor. So the transverse abdominis, this is a fancy word for the abdominal muscle that wraps around your body. It forms a girdle that actually creates your waistline. This is the deepest of the four abdominal muscles, and its main job is to provide support to the organs as well as decompress your spine. Well, you can imagine you put a giant watermelon in your stomach, it's gonna really stretch, stretch, stretch out that muscle, which then causes it to lose some of its integrity and its function. Oftentimes, this is the muscle where even years postpartum, people will say, well, I never really lost my baby weight. I never really got my waist back. Um, and a lot of times that has to do with not rebuilding the muscle tension of the transverse abdominis. So as that muscle retightens after delivery, it's gonna start to pull your abdomen in and give you that waistline. 
Um, oftentimes we'll see that people don't quite connect with that muscle postpartum and, and um, Nicole and I will share some strategies for how to find that muscle. Um, and as a result, the, the stomach just kind of maintains that loosey goosey type shape postpartum. The uh, rectus abdominis muscle is the six pack muscle. This is the abdominal muscle that runs from just under your chest bone to the top of your pelvis. Um, it's the one that gets the little six packs in it and looks so darn great when you're out on the beach and you're 19 and you know everything is grand. Um, what happens during pregnancy is that muscle actually stretches as well in the abdomen. The interesting thing about the rectus abdominis is down the middle, and I'll show you this on the slide in a little bit, um, it has a, a really large thick tendon. As that muscle is stretched, that tendon can start to pull apart and cause what's known as diastasis rectus or a separation of the abdominal muscles. I have a slide coming up where we'll talk a little bit more specifically about that, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as one of the things that happens during pregnancy. Um, when we mess with these muscles of the abdominal floor, what happens is it can lead to instability in the spine and the pelvis. Those muscles really help to cinch the midsection. And if we stretch them in different ways, it can cause a lot of instability in the back and in the hips. Certainly the weight of the fetus sitting um, in the pelvic bowl is going to actually stretch the pelvic floor muscles. So the pelvic floor muscles sit like a hammock in between the two sides of the pelvis and their job is threefold. It's to hold all the organs in and not let them fall out between your legs. It's to you, um, manage bowel and bladder function, so peeing and pooping. And then it's also for sexual function. So those muscles will help to create orgasm and manage kind of what your pelvic floor does during sexual function. What happens is when we put that watermelon in on the pelvic floor, the weight of the baby on the pelvic floor will actually start to stretch those muscles. And over time, they can become very overstretched. Um, if after delivery, we don't manage and rebuild the tension of that pelvic floor muscles, over time, this can lead to incontinence. So whether that's peeing your pants while you're jump roping or running, or peeing your pants when you sneeze, um, whether it's having to get to the bathroom really quickly, it can manifest itself in a variety of different ways, all which can be managed through pelvic floor therapy. The last thing that can happen um, during delivery is we can start to see the presence of prolapse. Prolapse is when some of the internal organs start to come out through the vaginal or rectal opening. Um, this is most common at the bladder as well as the um, cervix. So we can have a uterine or a bladder prolapse where those organs start to come out through the opening of the vagina. Um, this is typically something that happens later in life, like in the 50s and 60s. However, healthy pelvic floor activities postpartum will help to prevent this from happening down the road. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, during delivery, if you have either a cesarean, uh, which obviously is gonna cause an abdominal scar, or if you have a tearing or episiotomy, which would cause a vaginal scar, that scarring can actually lead to problems down the road um, because the scar tissue will form and restrict the tissue from moving. So certainly we'll talk through a variety of these as we go through the management of it through pain, but it's important to understand all of the significant changes that happen as a result of carrying that baby for nine months and then either passing it through cesarean or through a vaginal delivery. Okay, so a lot of times I meet my uh, postpartum moms because of pain, um, and that could be pain occurring in a variety of different positions, uh, different areas of the body, which we'll cover in a second. Um, the other reason that I meet my postpartum moms is because they have a really awesome OBGYN who refers them over after having a baby because they recognize how crazy the body responds during pregnancy. Um, and the third reason is because they're peeing their pants. Uh, so those are the three main reasons why I often will see um, someone postpartum. I really, really advocate for all moms to see a pelvic floor physical therapist after uh, pregnancy, whether it's immediately postpartum or years down the road postpartum, um, just so that we can look at the integrity of the pelvic floor and abdomen to make sure that you're protected against future issues. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the common pain problems that we see specifically postpartum. 
So the first is vaginal pain. So this is pain within the vagina. Um, this can occur either at the opening or circular opening of the vagina, or it can occur very deep in the vagina, which typically presents itself during sexual intercourse with penetration. So whether it is the stretching of the vagina to um, have insertion for sexual intercourse or tampon use, um, or if it is the deep penetration, which can cause vaginal pain, either one of those are very typical postpartum for a variety of different reasons. Um, a lot of times uh, when people have this vaginal pain, it actually results in a restriction on their ability to have sexual intercourse, whether that's full on sexual intercourse or just parts of sexual intercourse. Um, it also limits things like going to the OBGYN for annual visits. So you can imagine if you have a very sore vagina or a, a, a tight vagina that's limited because of scar tissue, when they put in a speculum to try to open your vagina, that can be very, very painful. Um, it can also be painful to use a tampon um, because inserting could cause that recreation of pain. But then even just simple things like walking around or going to the bathroom, passing a bowel movement, all of those things can recreate that vaginal pain. Um, certainly there's several remedies. Um, and this is one of the things that I'm really passionate about getting out into the, um, into, into the public knowledge is that vaginal pain is very treatable. And the way we do that in pelvic floor physical therapy is through a variety of different ways. Um, if you happen to have scar tissue, uh, we will do some massage and mobilization to that vaginal scar uh, externally. Um, and we'll show you how to do that so that you can manage it yourself. Uh, we'll also do a series of different muscle relaxation and massage uh, techniques to the internal pelvic floor muscles. Um, that's done by inserting a finger into the vagina and using um, your finger to release those muscles. Um, there's also plenty of different tools that we can use to help uh, recreate that same relaxation. And then the last thing is desensitization. And essentially that's a fancy way of saying letting your vagina get used to the sensation so that it doesn't cause pain that's very limiting. Um, so obviously you can imagine this is a very intimate conversation between the pelvic floor therapist and the patient, but certainly one where we'll work together to help to alleviate that pain, to allow you to get back to whatever it is that you need to, whether that's sexual intercourse, um, you know, tolerating an OBGYN appointment, or just typical daily tasks that might be limited because of that pain. The second type of common pain postpartum is sacroiliac pain. Um, this is also known as SI joint pain, SI pain, or the really layman's word, which isn't quite that technical um, or accurate, but a lot of people will call it that, is sciatic pain. Um, this is where you have pain in the area where the base of the spine and the pelvis meet. And typically it occurs on one side or the other. So if I were to show you on myself, the base of the spine comes down here like a triangle. My two hip bones or pelvic bones are on the side and usually right on either side, either one or the other, you'll have a sharp, almost knife-like pain that can occur with a variety of different activities. Um, some of the common things that I'll hear is pain with rolling over in bed and it's like a sharp stabbing pain. Uh, standing on one leg or going up and down the stairs. So maybe you're like standing on one leg to put your pants on or um, stepping into the shower or into the car, you'll get that stabbing pain there. Um, or getting up and down from a low surface, like a low chair or a couch. Um, and then lastly, oftentimes it can be very problematic with just walking, because if you imagine, walking is just a series of moving from one foot to another. So it's almost like standing on one leg in a repeated fas fashion. Um, SI joint pain is typically caused by an instability around the pelvis uh, because of poor muscle contraction of the abdominals, pelvic floor, and the hip girdle. So oftentimes when remedying this issue, um, I will go to things like pelvic and abdominal stabilizing exercises. And I know that Nicole is going to touch on some of these um, in the future. Um, also, we can talk about different modifications to activities for short-term pain management, um, but certainly with our goal being getting you back to all of the things that you typically would want to do. The last type of pain that I see common postpartum is low back pain. Uh, low back pain is typically more central and radiates across the entire back on both sides. So rather than being just a one-sided stabbing pain, this is more like a broad-based 
uh, type of pain that occurs right across the low back. Oftentimes, this is worse in the evening um, when you've been up on your feet all day or can occur with things like prolonged standing, lifting, or walking. Um, again, typically low back pain is caused by abdominal weakness and hip girdle weakness. Um, and really it comes as a result of our body learning those bad habits of kind of thrusting that large pregnant belly out and hanging on the back part of our back. So we lose that ability to stabilize through the abdomen. And as a result, we get that very, very difficult pain across the low back. So when, um, when completing physical therapy for this or managing that low back pain, we typically will focus on abdominal stabilizing exercises. Um, we'll go through a series of different stretches to help restore that flexibility of the spine. And then certainly we'll talk about how to space out your tasks and how to modify your activities so that it isn't problematic for you with other daily tasks. Okay, let's talk a little bit about diastasis rectus. This is a really hot topic in the postpartum world. Um, I do wanna start by saying, take a deep breath, okay? It's not a life-threatening issue and it is certainly something that can be addressed. This is something that I think has gotten really blown up in the media as being like a serious condition that is definitely difficult to manage. Um, there are ways that we can manage diastasis rectus. Um, as well as improve the function of the overall abdominal cavity. So let's talk first about what it is. Um, we briefly discussed this before, but this photo shows it great. Um, you'll notice that in the, the woman on the left, she's got her nice little six pack abs right at her belly button. There's a little bit of, you'll see that white tendon above and below, which extends up towards the rib cage and down towards the pubic bone. That is the rectus abdominis central tendinous line. As the uh, pregnant belly grows in the photo on the right, you'll see that that line becomes overstretched and pulled apart. Typically for women who have had a very taut abdominal cavity, maybe because they're very physically fit prior to pregnancy, the tendency for that to separate can be higher because the overall tension of the muscle is higher. So think about it this way. If you had six pack abs before, those mu that muscle is very, very taut. And as the belly grows, there's no place for it to stretch. So it starts to pull apart and separate. We see that separation most predominantly just above and below the belly button. And we can often feel that in uh, a postpartum mom by putting a finger right in your belly button, pressing in, and then thinking about doing like a little lift up sit up off of the bed. So if I was laying down, I put my finger in my belly button and I lift up. And sometimes you can feel your fingers sink in to that little bit of separation. Uh, postpartum, what can happen is that if we don't build the integrity of the abdominal muscles, both the transverse abdominis, the really deep one, as well as the rectus abdominis, we can have some prolonged separation. Sometimes that separation can close on its own. Um, but oftentimes it needs a little bit of facilitation through muscle training. And in many situations, it never closes fully. This does not mean that your abdominal muscles are broken or that you can't do certain things and that you can't exercise or you're gonna have pain, none of those things. Um, I have had three kids and I have a diastasis rectus that still has a portion of it separated. Um, and I participate in very, very high level physical activity um, and am able to manage any kind of abdominal pressure issues and back pain issues by training the remaining muscles and, and the muscles to work around that. And I know Nicole's gonna talk a little bit about core stability in her portion. Um, and really the way that we manage this is we teach those muscles how to work again so that they're able to support your abdomen. One of the chief signs of a diastasis rectus, particularly early on postpartum, but can certainly last well past um, delivery is what's known as abdominal coning. And this is when you lay on your back, you lift up your head like you're doing a little baby crunch and you look down and it looks like your belly is making a straight up cone uh, right down on your stomach. Um, and this is your, essentially it's the internal portion of your abdomen poking through that separation of the abdominal muscles. Um, certainly, again, nothing to be afraid of and something that is very, very well managed with proper training. 
Last thing I'll talk about is the pelvic floor. Um, certainly pelvic floor, we talked about the purpose of the pelvic floor already, which is to help support the organs, to manage bowel and bladder function, and also to participate in sexual function. The beauty of the pelvic floor is it's a series of muscles that work together with the diaphragm, which is like the lid of the body, and the abdomen, which is like the circumference. Those three muscle groups, the pelvic floor, the diaphragm, and the abdominal muscles that wrap around create what we call a canister of the trunk. So when we talk about core stability or trunk stability, we're really talking about the ability of the body to coordinate all three of those muscle groups to create a good sense of tension and stability around the spine and the pelvis. Um, certainly because of that overstretching and the postural changes that happen during pregnancy, those muscles, particularly the pelvic floor, can become really overstretched and inhibited, which means that they're not turning on correctly. And as a result, we want to make sure that we rehabilitate them so that they can work correctly. The typical exercise that many people know about to help facilitate the pelvic floor or turn on the pelvic floor is known as a Kegel. However, many people don't perform this exercise correctly. Um, this is where it really is important to have a skilled person evaluate your Kegel strength and endurance and quality so that you certainly are getting the best type of contraction possible. Um, in the download at the end of the presentation, there is a portion on Kegels there to help turn on that pelvic floor and it talks through the strategy. But just briefly, uh, the way that I teach a Kegel is to imagine that you have a flower with all of its petals blossoming out of your vagina and you're gonna pull all of the petals into your vagina. So you shouldn't be squeezing your butt, you shouldn't be squeezing your legs together. Um, if you were on camera and doing it right now, I shouldn't see you kind of popping up and down because you're squeezing your butt cheeks as you're kegeling. It's strictly an exercise that occurs inside the vagina and in the pelvic floor. The other thing is you wanna make sure that you're not holding your breath when you're doing your kegel because like we talked about with that diaphragm, the uh, pelvic floor should be able to contract while you maintain steady breathing. There's three main types of Kegels um, that are really beneficial to perform. The one first is a Kegel with a hold. The second is known as a quick flick, which is turning the muscle on and off quickly. And the third is called a Kegel elevator where you progressively build your Kegel and then release it fully. So certainly um, the take home message here is that if you've never had your Kegel uh, assessed, I encourage you to have that assessed by a skilled physical therapist or pelvic floor therapist. Um, to make sure that you're doing it correctly because that is gonna be your foundational exercise for building the uh, strength of your pelvic floor. All right, so let me pass off to Nicole who's gonna talk about the myths and misconceptions of exercise postpartum. All right, thank you very much, that was awesome. Um, okay, so bounce back, get your body back. Everybody, you know, you see the advertisements, you see everybody talking about it, you see all the, you know, fitspos and <laughs> talking about, you know, how fast can you get back to exercise? Um, first of all, our bodies go through a lot through pregnancy as everyone here probably has learned at this point. Um, it's probably not gonna be the exact same again as it was before, but that's not a bad thing. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of things, you know, the ligaments, like Kristen said, um, the bones, everything makes room for the baby and then makes room to birth the baby, which is all pretty incredible that our bodies do that on their on its own. Um, so we should not really focus on like, how do I get back to doing that exact thing that I was doing before? um, or looking the same exact way. Instead, um, I like to kind of encourage moms to let's rebuild from a stronger foundation. So let's kind of not start over, but start, you know, back up a little bit, slow down. It's a really good time to get to know your body a little bit better. Maybe you got into fitness or exercise or sports at a young age, and you never really learned certain techniques properly. And you kind of just did a lot of it without thinking. So um, pregnancy and postpartum, I think is a great time to maybe learn better form, um, learn your body a little bit better. And um, like I said, rebuild from, you know, a stronger foundation from the inside out and more mindful exercise as well. Um, 
And then another misconception, which I learned this <laughs> through experience is, you know, if you were fit or active or strong or whatever you were doing before that you'll just, you know, have your baby and be back after six weeks and like, you know, nothing ever happened. You'll get right back to doing what you were doing before. Um, this is definitely not something to expect. There, there certainly are people who can do a lot early on. Um, but then again, you don't really know what other people are going through, whether they're having symptoms that they're dealing with, they're not talking about, um, or maybe down the road, things catch up to them that they don't realize. Um, so I think everyone, no matter how fit, whatever that looks like um, you are beforehand, I think everyone should start you know, start slowly getting back into fitness or sport or whatever, um, after having a baby. Um, and all of the things that, you know, contribute to postpartum. So you could have maybe a really difficult pregnancy that had you on bed rest or, you know, things like that, or health concerns. Maybe you had an easy pregnancy, but your birth was really traumatic. Maybe it was a really long labor. Maybe, um, there was a lot of tearing, stitching, things like that. Maybe you had a cesarean, which is a major surgery. Um, so the, the type of birth and that's going to affect your postpartum recovery, um, how you feed your baby. So whether you breastfeed or not, that's going to have different, um, impact on your, on your schedule, on your body, on your hormones, um, as Chris, Chris mentioned earlier. Um, and then other things that people don't really consider as far as, you know, their own postpartum recovery, um, things like your support at home, maybe you're a single parent, maybe you're traveling, maybe you have other kids, maybe you don't have family around. Um, so if you're doing a lot on your own, or if you have a lot of help, that's going to affect your recovery. And then sleep is a big one. <laughs> um, a lot of babies don't sleep a lot in the beginning. Some do. Um, so that's going to affect your recovery. And then nutrition, um, if you're eating to support your recovery, if you're eating enough, if you're eating the right foods, um, if we all kind of go into postpartum already depleted from pregnancy and childbirth. So it's really important to get the nutrition um, back on track as far as you know supporting recovery. So all of those things will affect everyone differently. And then um, maybe, you know, meant from a mental perspective, you don't really want to do what you've been doing, what you were doing before. So a lot of people go through, you know, major shifts when they have babies become parents. And, um, you know, maybe your lifestyle changes, maybe your interests change, and uh, maybe you found something else that you enjoy while you were pregnant, and um, you don't want to go back to doing what you were doing before. So you might have kind of like a, an identity shift, which is, totally fine as well. Um, so, all right. So when you are ready to return, regardless of your experience, um, what you're doing, what sport exercise activity, um, everyone should start slowly. Um, I said, so there's the six week, which is kind of, um, pretty standard, I think, um, as a follow-up appointment, whether you see it, OB or a midwife or whoever your provider is. Um, but sometimes that can be a long time to, if you're home and you're feeling like, you know, I don't want to exercise, but I just feel like I need to move my body. You know, you've had a few weeks and um, you just want to move <laughs> or you're tight, you're sore. Um, I always, you know, recommend take at least a week or two at least um, to just chill out, rest, sleep, recover. Um, at least at the very least, definitely more if you need it. But then once you get to that point and you just feel like, you know, I've been holding my baby all night. Um, I've been sitting a lot and I'm just, I'm just tight. I'm sore. I'm weak. I feel like I need, I feel like some activity would definitely help. Um, I'm going to go over a little more specific exercises, um, in a, in a few minutes, but, um, try like one or two or me at the most, like three things, like one set, and then, um, then take a day off, see how your body responds. Um, if you feel any symptoms at all, which I'll go over those in a second, um, any symptoms at all, you want to stop right away. Um, give yourself that, you know, day or two in between trying new things just to see how you feel, monitor your symptoms. And then, um, you might feel like, Oh, I feel really good. And then you kind of start to get into it. And then your body's like, chill out. I'm not ready for that yet. 
So some symptoms you want to look out for bleeding is a big one. Um, often when you start to, um, increase your activity after having a baby, you will experience some bleeding. So if you start to notice that increase, obviously, um, stop, kind of reevaluate what you're doing, um, pain or discomfort anywhere that could be, you know, vaginal, that could be abdominal back pain and pain anywhere, um, that wasn't there before, um, any kind of leaking or incontinence, um, any pressure or bulging feeling that's just going to be a sign that, you know, something's not ready or you might need to, you know, adjust some strategies. And then again, the diastasis with the bulging or coning of the abdomen is a big one. So those are all things to look out for. Um, some were more severe than others. Some you will, you will deal with, um, whether it's early on or down the road, um, some are manageable. So, um, but those are the, the main symptoms I think to look out for. I always recommend everyone pelvic floor PT. It's just nice to get checked up. And then, uh, and the trainer, especially if you're really totally like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, it doesn't hurt to find a trainer. Um, fortunately it's becoming a thing now. So there are a lot of uh, people out there certified in training, um, prenatal and postpartum women, but, um, oftentimes that you might find, you know, someone had a baby and they're like, Oh, you know, I know how to train people or my wife had a baby. And so like I can train. So make sure like, if you're, if you're looking for someone, um, as a trainer or coach, um, that they've actually are specialized in training postpartum women, because there are a lot of things to know. Um, so then I'll get into, um, a few more specific exercises, which is, I'm sure everybody wants to know. Yeah. And I want to just <laughs> echo, um, Nicole's point about the incontinence or, or leaking. So I know a lot of times, um, I'll have patients come in and they'll tell me, oh, well, you know, it's fine. Sometimes when I go up and down the steps, you know, I pee my pants a little bit, or, you know, I tried a fast walk the other day and I peed my pants a little bit, but that's okay. That's just normal after, um, pregnancy. That's not normal. That is your body's way of telling you that it's not strong enough to support your bladder function. So um, certainly if you are experiencing any type of leaking or incontinence during exercise, that means that either there's a technique problem with your exercise and your pressure management isn't good, or your pelvic floor isn't stable enough to support the body during that task. So as we um, you know, kind of go through the, the rest of the presentation, keep that in the back of your mind as you think about some of these exercises that Nicole's gonna introduce. Um, because uh, a, a colleague and uh, someone who is very well-versed in um, postpartum care always says, you know, peeing your pants is losing your form. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, and it really is truly the case. If you are peeing your pants or leaking, that may be, or that is your body's way of telling you that something's not quite right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so as far as getting back to exercise, um, the timing, so I can't really say like, oh, at four weeks you can do this. And at six weeks you can do that. Cause it's definitely going to vary for each person. Um, I'm a big, it depends person <laughs> because it really does depend on each individual situation. Um, so this is more of like a timeline, like work on these things first. And then when you kind of get that under control, then you can maybe move on to those things. So it's more like that versus like an exactly scheduled timeline. Um, so breath work is the first thing, um, that I like to talk about, and this can be done immediately postpartum, just reconnecting that core. Um, like Krista mentioned, the canister, you have your diaphragm, your abdominal muscles, your pelvic floor. Um, they all work together. So you're not really, you don't really want to like isolate your pelvic floor muscles or isolate your abs. Everything works together as a team. So learning how to engage everything and work, have it work together so that you will support your core and your pelvic floor as you exercise. Um, so the very basic breath technique that um, I teach people. And then it, you, there are nuances depending on different strategies, but this is a good place to start. And then, um, you know, if you're working with a coach or a PT, um, they can help you if you're, you know, not breathing, like you might think you're doing something, but really your body's doing something totally different. Um, so when you inhale, so when you take a breath in, you, you can feel, if you kind of feel your stomach, you'll feel your stomach, your abdominals, everything kind of expand relax. You want to just let your pelvic floor relax. 
And then as you exhale is when you want to engage everything. So you exhale and then you can feel just not even naturally your belly button, your stomach's going to go in a little bit. And then if you think about it, um, your pelvic floor is going to lift that gentle Kegel. I like that elevator, um, uh, analogy. So, and then you relax, everything relaxes and then you exhale, everything engages. So working on just that coordination, um, trying to relax as much as you contract. So you're not like only lifting and sucking and squeezing. <laughs> um, you're also relaxing just as much. Um, and you're going back and forth and you're doing it slowly. You're doing, you know, the different strategies, like Kristen said, different, different, um, like tempos, things like that, but getting, um, everything to work together and then also practicing in different positions. So if you're like super early on, you can, you know, do these sitting or laying down. Um, I, I still, you know, train with my hand on my stomach often to just as like a cue of, you know, focusing on my breath work and my core. Um, and then once you kind of feel like you got the hang of that, then you can move and do them standing. And then another really good, um, postpartum thing to practice is laying on your stomach. I think we're often like in this super flex position, whether we're sitting or even like standing and holding our babies and kids. Um, but it's really important to also expand, open up, extend. So lay on your stomach and like a tummy time, I call it. And you just breathe into the floor. It's a really good one. Um, and then once you feel comfortable with that breath work, then you can start to use that tech technique to like across when you're doing other exercises. So, um, when, as you're moving, you're thinking about moving with your breath. Um, so, um, and then mobility and stretching that can kind of also be early on, um, some chest and shoulder openers I can kind of demonstrate, but think about when you're always like this early postpartum, you know, you're holding, you're nursing, you're hunched over, you're sitting. So anything that's going to do the opposite motion. So whether you just literally grab your hands behind your back, open, open, open your chest. Um, you take a band and, or a towel or a le dog leash, whatever you have, and just stretch all the way around. Um, so think of, think of doing the opposite of what you do all day long. If that is just an easy, like rule of thumb, um, stretching out your hips. So like kneeling down, um, with one leg in front and stretching those hips out because we're always sitting um, in those early postpartum weeks and months. So stretching can also be done early on. It'll feel good. Um, walking, that's going to be, you know, for each person. Um, same concept that I mentioned before, though, you want to kind of take it easy, start off with, you know, like 10, 15 minutes, slow pace. Um, I wouldn't like wear your baby on your first walk. Um, that might be a lot. Um, so, you know, put the baby in the stroller, have somebody else carry that, wear them. Um, and then give yourself a day, see how your body responds to, you know, that walk. And then if everything's fine, you know, you can continue doing that. You can add distance or time. And then, um, I would wait a few weeks before you did like a long, you know, a walk with baby wearing, um, cause that can be a lot, um, of tension on your core and pelvic floor. It's like an extra 10 to 15 pounds. <laughs> um, so uh, walking is a good early on in the first few weeks. And then some core and body weight stuff. So, so all fours is a great position to start practicing um, just activating your core. So all fours, you know, hands and knees, make sure your wrists are below your shoulder, directly under your shoulders and your knees are directly under your hips. Just starting in that position and just practice that breath work that I talked about. Inhale, relax everything, exhale, engage, inhale, relax, exhale, engage. And then you can start to move through, um, you know, like a cat cow in yoga, um, rocking back and forth. So you're still in all fours, but you're just rocking back and forth. You're kind of just changing position a little bit. Um, and then a bird dog, what it says here is just opposite arm and leg, reaching out away from the midline um, moving slowly. Um, and I have some references I can send you guys to, to actually view some of these exercises to give you a better, um, idea. Um, so yeah, all fours is great to just work on, you know, just a different position, um, giving, you know, working against gravity with your core, uh, squats are just super functional. You have to get up off the couch. You have to get off the toilet. You have to get out of your car. You have to get out of bed. So, um, squats, 
are fine um, early on. Just this is where it's really good to um, engage that core work that we talked about. So exhale, think of exhale on exertion. So the harder part of the exercise is when you wanna breathe out because you're naturally, as you exhale, your pelvic floor will lift as like a reflex and your core will engage. You don't have to think about it and try really, really hard. Um, just engaging that exhale from the you know beginning of the hard part of the movement is gonna, it's gonna have to do it anyway. So squatting, so sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up from the couch, starting from there. Um, and then once you feel really good doing some of those, then you can try, you know, holding your baby or, you know, holding something weighted um, or lowering your, your chair, your seat. Um, so squats are really good. And then glute work. Glutes are really important because, you know, strong glutes will definitely support your lower back. It supports your pelvic floor. So, um, and they tend to get underutilized often, <laughs> um, especially when we're sitting a lot. Um, so anything that's going to um, <clears throat> work your glutes, laying on the floor on your back with your knees bent and pressing your hips up to the floor, so off the floor towards the ceiling as a bridge, um, squeezing your glutes. A hip hinge is anything where you're standing and you just hinge your hips back and forward. So you can do that literally just with body weight, practicing like you're standing up and then you're going to touch the wall behind you with your butt. Then you stand up, then you try to touch the wall behind you with your butt. So you could literally do that with no weight. Um, you can do that with a band. You can do that with a lightweight. Um, and then um, finally, another body weight exercise I have um, to work upper body and a little more core. So incline, planks or push-ups and or push-ups. Um, literally start on the wall is like the first level of um, that I would begin and see how you feel. So literally put your hands on the wall and then you can just gradually move your feet out, trying that plank position, see how your core feels. You can do some push-ups, And then as you just get stronger and you feel better, um, you can just lower that height. So back of the couch, seat of the couch, then you're on the floor on your knees maybe. And then you're playing around with like a little bit on your toes, a little bit on your knees. And then, you know, big graduation to on your toes. <laughs> Um, so those are all great. You don't need equipment. You don't need anything. All that can be done body weight, um, or with your baby. <laughs> um, but just that, you know, that balance of glutes, um, a little bit upper body, some squatting, some core, and then always, always coming back to that breath, um, starting slow, doing everything to where you can think about your strategy of breathing. So when you, um, exhale on exertion, like I said, and then, eventually when you train yourself, you don't, you won't have to fit like this. What isn't like forever, like, you know, after 10 years, you're like still like doing everything super slowly and thinking about it the whole time. So the beauty of it is the more you do it, the more you practice it, the more it becomes, um, just automatic, automatic. So your body will breathe without you having to think about it. It just, you'll have to train it in the beginning, just like anything else. Um, you have to train your breath work, um, with your exercise and then eventually it becomes second nature and you won't have to think about it so much. Um, and then finally, so then you, you know, we start with the breath work, some stretching, some walking, then we move on to body weight. And then once you've gotten, you know, you can do all this stuff, you feel good, you're not having symptoms, then, you know, maybe you can move on to some resistance training, resistances, bands, kettlebells, dumbbells, any kind of weights, um, your baby in a carrier <laughs> is resistance, um, so just, you just want to make sure you're not having any symptoms with something before you move on and increase any kind of load. So if you're, if you're having symptoms, you obviously don't want to add weight. You don't want to do more. Um, you want to figure out what's causing your symptoms, whether it's your body, just not ready, whether you're just, you know, pushing it too soon. Um, or if there's a form breath and breathing, some kind of situation, or if you're just not engaging things the way that you think you are, um, whatever the case, you want to make sure you take care of that before you increase anything. Um, <clears throat> and then the final, the final chapter, once you've gotten through all of that, you know, weeks, months, however long it takes you to get to that point, then we can start talking about impact. Impact meaning jumping, running, 
um, things like that. So I know for people who are avid runners, it's like, how soon can I run? You definitely don't want to just go out the door and start running right away. You want to establish this base of, <clears throat> excuse me, core work and uh, breath work, core work, and then body weight strength. Um, there's different screenings you can do, you know, some single leg work, some things to do that are important to, um, to do before you start running. Um, and then once you, once you are at that point of running more like 12 weeks down the road, just to kind of give people, um, an idea, uh, um, you want to start with like intervals. So just a little bit at a time, um, you know, a few, a minute, 30 seconds, whatever it is for you and then back off. And then you kind of want to start intervals like that. Same thing with jumping. If you go to, if you do CrossFit or if you do anything where you're jumping rope or things like that, um, same concept <clears throat> when you start to implement them, um, intervals, just a little bit at a time, see how your body feels. And then, um, you can always increase, but, um, you don't want to just go, you know, full steam ahead with things like that. So that's your timeline of, um, whether it's, you know, it's going to be weeks, months, it's going to vary at the actual time, but you want to get your breath work established, your core, your body weight, then you can start talking about adding resistance. And then the final thing, after you've gotten all those without symptoms, then you can move on to impact. And that's such a great summary, Nicole. Thank you for that. I, I, I love the progression here. And I use a similar analogy um, when, when I'm rehabilitating postpartum moms as well, um, in that, you know, we've got to build the foundation first, which is your pelvic floor and abdomen. And then from there, we've got to build stability on both legs and then stability on one leg and then introduce jumping. So if you think about it, you know, you want to have great stability through both legs um, because then once we take one leg away, if you imagine a bar stool, if we take away two legs of a bar stool and that one leg isn't stable enough to hold, you're going to topple over and that's when we're going to start to see problems. Same thing occurs if we go too quickly from one leg to jumping or running. So I know that there's uh, one of the biggest questions I get is like, like you said, Nicole, how, how soon can I get back to running? The sad answer is it depends because it depends on your pelvic floor stability and your abdominal stability. It depends on how sturdy your hip girdle is through the pregnancy and then how quickly you're able to transition to those one-legged or impact related exercises. And really the best way to know that is to have someone help guide you through that process. All right, so um, just a quick slide on who, what, when. Um, you know, people oft, often say postpartum, I'm like, I don't know who I'm supposed to go see. Um, this, this slide helps to break that down. Uh, things that you would wanna consider to see a physical therapist for, if you're having any kind of pain, whether it's with activity, exercise, um, any, any daily tasks. Uh, if you're having any pelvic floor or vaginal pain, so pain with sex, constipation, pain with a, um, OBGYN exam, uh, that would be an indication to see a PT. Um, if you need some training for your abdominals and pelvic floor muscles because of things like incontinence or abdominal coning, like we talked about with the diastasis rectus, um, or if because another provider says like, hey, you probably should see a pelvic floor PT. Um, there's definitely a network of providers who are very aware of the different ways that pelvic floor therapists can help. Um, and certainly we appreciate those referrals from other providers like someone like Nicole. Um, in, uh, on the opposite end of things, um, if you are feeling pretty good postpartum, but you need some maybe guidance in your fitness program, whether it's creation or actually leading you through it, an athletic trainer or personal trainer who specializes in postpartum recovery is your best bet. Um, like Nicole mentioned early on, that can occur both in a group training or one-on-one -on -one type of session. And it's really just that opportunity for a skilled, knowledgeable person to monitor your form and guide you through that, that progress. Um, also, um, you know, considering using someone like Nicole, if you're looking for um, guidance in diet um, or some other maybe, you know, mental health or, um, you know, meditative mindfulness type things, um, that's where an athletic or personal trainer could really, really be helpful um, in guiding you through that postpartum care. So really in conclusion, before we open up for question and answer, um, you know, postpartum recovery, as much as it's a lot of things happening, both mentally, physically, and emotionally, uh, we want to help make that postpartum recovery very enjoyable so that you can get back to the things that you enjoy physically and actively. Um, exercise is certainly gonna be one of the keys to help restore your pelvic floor and your abdominal muscles so that you have that foundation to take you into either exercise, 
um, on a, a, a more fitness style level or some heavier lifting techniques that you would need just for daily tasks, like lifting up a laundry basket or lifting the hood of your car, whatever the case is. Um, you know, Nicole and I are, are huge advocates that a strong mom is a healthy mom. Uh, we want to make sure that you're strong both in mind, body, and spirit so that you're able to care for your baby and care for yourself the best way possible. Um, and really, you know, we are here to help in any way possible. Um, I often tell people, you know, even if you never come to see me for physical therapy um, or you never go to see Nicole for personal training, um, reach out to us. We're happy to provide resources, um, connections, introductions, whatever the case may be to help ease your uh, transition because we do truly believe that we want to be there for our moms because moms are the ones that kind of get the shaft that they're they're made to deal with all these things and have to kind of bear carry the weight um, and we want to make sure that our moms know that there is support available um, here is the download that I promised earlier in the presentation, reachyours.com backslash pelvic. Um, if you go to that website and enter in your email address, you can download my top five pelvic floor stabilizer exercises. And certainly, if there's any questions for Nicole or I, both of our emails are here um, for you to drop any type of question. If you don't feel comfortable asking it on the forum, you can send us that uh, questions to either of these emails, as well as if you're interested in free consultations with either one of us, uh, just drop us an email. And we'll be happy to set you up with that.